This is the Iron Cage Seminar for um, people who are interested in sociology and psychology and related subjects such as ethics and religious studies, all of which will be weaved into this seminar. Now, normally this would be taking place in the flesh, but obviously because of the quarantine lockdown, uh, we can no longer meet up as, as um, human to human, face to face. So we're experimenting with online seminars that you can listen to at your leisure. And obviously you can pause and restart and have a cup of tea or, or what have you as you go along and um, engage with this as and when you please. Once this seminar is up online, I intend to keep it up there for the foreseeable future. So there's no rush that you have to listen to it before a certain period for uh, concern of it being taken down, it will be up for the, the duration as it were. And if this proves popular, then some of the other planned seminars that would have taken place were it not for coronavirus may well also go ahead as online seminars. So what is this particular seminar on the Iron Cage about? Well, the Iron Cage is a concept that was advanced by the German sociologist Max Weber. And so we're going to explore his idea of the iron cage and the notions of rationalization and bureaucracy and related concepts of disenchantment of human beings with the, the modern world and look at a variety of interrelated ideas from various diverse sources of um, sociologists and some psychologists and some ethicists and even some people within the religious studies realm because all of these concepts interrelate to each other. And so we'll explore along now. What we cannot do, because this is an online seminar, obviously, is have a question and answer directly involved in this. But if there is sufficient interest, we can always set up something in the vein of a Skype um, chat to discuss the ideas and concepts. If people email me and let me know they would like that, then we can engage with you at a, a sort of... Um, well, kind of a face-to-face -face way, albeit via the uh, joys of the internet. So where does this idea stem from? Well, it comes to a large extent from uh, another German, Friedrich Schiller, who back in the late 1700s wrote poetry and extensive papers and, and books and so forth, and postulated quite a number of ideas, only some of which are directly relevant here. Uh, one of the notions that he advanced was um, that in the ancient world, and, and he was particularly interested in the ancient Greeks, but there's no reason why this concept should be confined to Greece. It applies as much to Rome, to Egypt, to China, to the Germanic countries, the Celtic countries, and, and a whole variety of other places. He advanced the idea that in the distant past, people had been um, polytheists, believers in many gods, many goddesses, and animists, um, usually both at the same time. Um, animism is the belief in a whole raft of spirits, not quite as big and grand as gods and goddesses, but a whole raft of spirits animating trees and rocks and rivers and associated with animal species and so on. So Fr Friedrich's key arms, um, sorry, argument here was that the world to the ancient mind was inhabited by a vast array of spirits. Some of those spirits were kind and caring and beneficial. Some of them were frightening and predatory and dangerous. And some of them, probably the majority, let's face it, were quite indifferent to the passage of human activities. Now for Schiller, the question is not whether or not people of the ancient world were correct in thinking this. Were there really gods such as Zeus and Hera and Apollo and Artemis? abounding in the world? Were there really dryads in every tree and nereads in every river? That's not a question which Schiller felt particularly drawn to answer. Rather, he was what we might term, these days at least, uh, an ethical pragmatist, in that he looked at the pragmatic value of ethical theories and ideological beliefs. What was the benefit of having a belief. Did this change the behavior of the believer for the better or for the worse, or indeed make no difference whatsoever? In which case you've got to ask, what's the point of having an ideology if it doesn't make the slightest difference to your life at all? But that's a separate issue. 
Uh, Schiller's argument when it came to polytheism and animism was that this made people better if they viewed the world as a magical, wonderful place full of weird and wondrous spirits and beings and entities. They tended to treat the world in a far better way than those people who had come as a result of the Enlightenment and rationalism and so forth, who had come to view the world as mechanistic, soulless, bereft of anything, just biological functions chugging along without any any spirit, any drive, any anything deeper than can be seen with the naked eye. So he felt the world had become a greyer place and people had become more um, careless in their treatment of the world, of the other human beings and the various other species with which they shared the planet as a result of their loss of faith in a realm of spirits. And for Schiller, it doesn't particularly matter whether that faith is a belief in ancient Greek spirits or German spirits or Celtic spirits or indeed Christian spirits of saints and so angels and, and so forth. The, the exact language that is used to describe the realm of spirits is much less important than the conviction that the world is full of wondrous beings, a world soul. Max Weber, when he came along, picked up on Schiller's ideas. He was a very well-read man, incorporated into his philosophies and ideas a vast realm of pre-existing research and propositions and philosophies and notions and ideas and, and reworked them in all sorts of different ways. Um, as a German, obviously, he wrote in German. And so the term he used was Stahates Gehaus. Now, apologies for anyone who actually does speak German for my appalling accents there. And pronunciations. Um, Stelhatis Gehaus means to have a cage of steel, or, or, or a shell of steel rather than a cage, I should say, a shell of steel. So you could think of shell much like a crab shell here, an encasement, a protection, or, or like the shell of a, a tank, or a, a knight in, encased in armour, the, the metal shell that protects the soft, vulnerable insides from the harshness of the outside. But a shell, of course, is both protective at one level, but also restrictive. I mean, that just as nothing can get in, so nothing can get out of that steel shell. Um, the, the choice of steel is arguably intentional. It's not just any old random metal that was used for the uh, poetic analogy because steel is a, a an unnatural material it doesn't occur in nature steel is um human made it's manufactured it's a synthetic if you like a combination of other occurring metals and therefore that's that there is an intent here in that choice of metal for for the, the poetic description that the the shell or what um, Talcott Parsons, an American sociologist who translated Max Weber's book into English for the first time in 1930, he translated that shell of steel into the term iron cage, which is the one that is much better known in the English speaking world. So whether we're talking steel or iron, obviously there is that iron is a naturally occurring material, whereas steel is not. So there is a subtle shift in um, poetic imagery going on here. But the notion is that the, the shell or the cage, however you wish to describe it, is created. It is not a naturally occurring thing. This is the key issue here. For Weber with the choice of steel, uh, we could say arguably Talcott Parsons with the term cage. Obviously a cage is a, 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 a human made structure. That in both the original German and the English translation, the notion is that this force, this barrier, which at one level protects from outside threats, but at the other level contains, restricts, limits the person contained within the shell or within the cage, um, is a an artificial thing, a false thing. It's something created by society. And therein is a key issue. So. Weber advances this term in his book, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. 
um, in which, amongst many other things, he argues that the schism between Catholic and Protestant, uh, um, the, the kind of, well, I say schism, effectively the creation of the protesting churches, the Protestant churches, led to the, what's termed the Protestant work ethic. The notion that moral Indians are virtually indistinguishable one from the other. That if you're not a hard worker, you can't be a morally good person. And if you're a morally good person, de facto, you must be a hard worker. The, the two go hand in glove. That industriousness, occupying your time, keeping busy, keeping focused, are key parts of moral goodness. Because not only as Protestants, but Catholics and many other people have said over the centuries, the devil makes work for idle hands, therefore spare time, recreational time, luxury time, time when you're putting your feet up and twiddling your thumbs, is viewed suspiciously because you will get up to stuff. Therefore, time should be spent with the nose to the grindstone so that you are focused, you're being industrious, you're working hard, you're keeping busy, you have no spare time in which to fill your mind with sinful thoughts and distractions and be led astray by the devil. Therefore, work is a moral good. The implication of this being that people who do not work hard are there to be tempted by the devil and to have their free time filled not with reading their Bible or praying or doing something morally appropriate, but with drinking and womanizing or, or manizing, for that matter, if there is indeed such a word as manizing, um, with, with uh, sins of the flesh, they will be led astray. And so work becomes a, a, a treatment, we can put it like that, for kind of wicked and sinful behavior. Now, this is hardly a brand new idea. If we go back to the early 1600s, uh, in Britain, the government instituted the House of Correction, which was a precursor to the workhouse, in which people who were uh, homeless, indigent, wanderers, beggars, tramps, uh, and not only wanderers and beggars and tramps and the homeless, but also people who did have a home, but uh, simply did not work or didn't work hard enough, could be put in the House of Correction. The argument being that the House of Correction would teach them, through rather vigorous means, if we can believe that, to learn the benefits of hard work, make them earn their bread, earn their keep in the House of Correction, and only when they were deemed to have learnt to work well and work hard and keep their nose to the grindstone and had a job to go to in the community, only then would they be released into their new life as hardworking and industrious, instead of being carried upon the coattails of society by begging for money or reliant upon church charities and the sort. Now, some of those people may indeed have been genuinely quite lazy, but plenty of them were unable to work due to illness, both mental and physical, um, grinding poverty, lack of education, lack of sufficient skills with which to acquire the kind of jobs that they might have liked to acquire, a whole raft of factors that had them deemed the feckless poor. An attitude that continued on into um, the, the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, and we can argue the 20th century, given the attitudes of some politicians around the world, probably the 21st century. The perception that there were the undeserving poor, the lazy, the idle, the drunken, the half-witted, the inbred. All of these ideas were layered one upon the other from the days of the House of Correction onwards and work their way into the Protestant ethic that um, it's not a good thing to be idle. You should always be working hard, and if you're not working hard, you should occupy your time and your hours off with other um, focused tasks like praying and Bible reading and so forth. This in itself, Faber argues, migrates out of Protestantism as a religious ethic, and as the world gets more and more secular, 
uh, of atheism and agnosticism become well, either more prevalent or at least more publicly spoken about. Nonetheless, Weber argues, this formerly religious ethic of uh, extolling the joys of hard work and the moral benefits of toil and labor transitions neatly into a secular non-religious sphere. And so it becomes something extolled regardless of whether people are religious or not, that everyone should work hard and earn their own keep, earn their own bread. No one should be carried upon the coattails of any other house. Um, and even when we get down to the days of Ayn Rand, the Russian-American economist and philosopher, he was ardently, passionately atheist and opposed all religion as corrupt and, and false and misleading, uh, most especially Christianity. She was ferociously opposed to Christianity. Um, she nonetheless was a, a proponent, passionate proponent, of what had formerly been called the, the Protestant work ethic, that everyone should attain to independence, to um, look after themselves, finance themselves, no one should be on state benefits, no one should subsist on handouts, um, not just to target the poor, but also the idle rich, that someone who inherited their wealth and just spent their life lolling about doing nothing in particularly useful was as much a burden upon society as a poor person who never had any wealth to start with and either could not or would not earn any. So she's a, a great admirer of anyone who was willing to earn their own bread and look after themselves and saw that as a, a moral yardstick to which everyone should seek and attain. And ironically, it's also part and parcel of what's nowadays termed the wealth gospel which is very popular in America and some other countries too. You encounter the Worth Gospel in this country, in Canada and Australia and Africa and various places. Um, the Wealth Gospel builds upon the Protestant work ethic to suggest that not only is hard work a virtue, industriousness is a virtue much approved of by God, but that God will reward the industriousness with material success. So those who are rich and well-off and... and successful are being rewarded by God for their industriousness. And of course, the flip side of that argument is that those who are poor and barely scraping in existence must de facto be sinful and being punished for their sins with, with the uh, deprival of money so that they are forced to, to um, suffer the consequences of their sinful behavior. This linking of wealth to moral goodness and poverty to moral badness persists and persists and persists in both religious and secular forms and helps to form and shape this concept of the iron cage or the steel shell, depending on which translation you prefer. So the quote we have there from Max Weber, the Puritan wanted to work in a calling we are forced to do so. For when asceticism was carried out of monastic cells into everyday life and began to dominate worldly morality, it did its part in building the tremendous cosmos of the modern economic order. So for Weber, the modern notion of investment capitalism is in no small part a, a kind of an aftermath of the Protestant schism and particularly the Puritan approach to work and money and finances. We would not have, Weber argues, neoliberal, not that neoliberalism existed in Max Weber's lifetime, but we wouldn't have investment capitalism in Weber's lifetime and neoliberalism in 21st century world were it not for the Protestant work ethic existing, and not everyone agrees with Weber on this, others suggest that actually that work ethic predates Protestantism and goes back to an, an earlier period of history. So there are disputations as to the exact historical origin of this attitude and outlook. But quite a lot of people, even those who um, argue the toss as to quite when this attitude and outlook and philosophy started, 
even the majority of them tend to agree that modern day 21st century economics exist in no small part because of this attitude that has persisted for quite a few centuries and created the world as it is today. Um, perhaps a point in Weber's quote there that's worth noting is the issue of force. What for the Puritan was a religious vocation to work hard, no matter what the type of work, to work hard was a, a religious calling. Nowadays, when in the West at least, a decreasing number of people have a strong religious vocation. Nonetheless, society as a whole imposes, encourages, forces people to, to have to work whether they have that vocation towards it or not. It is now a, a requirement. Most people would argue it always has been, but um, Weber's view was that an uh, uh, element of force had become stronger and stronger and stronger as the centuries have rolled on. Part of investment capitalism is that a very wealthy man, or indeed a very wealthy woman, with cash to spare, decides to invest some of that spare cash in buying up farms or factories or retail outlets or, or um, uh, research laboratories in the modern day, whatever it might be, they invest their wealth in buying up buildings and equipment. And then they employ people to work in said buildings, um, utilizing the equipment so that if we go back to say a thousand years, a carpenter would have their own tools create chairs, tables, um, furniture of whatever description they were creating and sell them. The, the individual would have their own tools, create the entirety of the product from beginning to end and then sell it at the marketplace for whatever they could get for it. So you have small scale cottage industry production. Investment capitalism moves beyond small scale cottage industry so that the person who owns the tools is no longer the individual tradesman or tradeswoman, the individual artisan. It is rather a person of wealth who perhaps knows next to nothing about carpentry or about farming or about um, whatever skill it happens to be. Rather, what they know about is investments and market values and market forces. They employ people who do have the expertise, who do have the skills and the knowledge and they provide them with raw materials, they provide them with tools, they provide them with a place to work. And at the end of the day, the individual clocks off and goes home. Now, whereas the cottage industry, you decide as a uh, one man, one woman cottage industry, when to get up, when to start working, when to finish working, when to have lunch, uh, all, all of that is down to you as an individual. When you are an employee for a wealthy industrialist who owns the means of production, and this is where we slide into Marxist arguments and ideologies, then obviously it's the person who owns the factory, who owns the shops, who owns the farms, who owns whatever the means of production happens to be in a given example. They are the one who tells you when to come to work, when you can have a lunch break, when you have to finish work. And it is also they who set the market value of the product that's retail. Now the cottage industry person, that's that a uh, carpenter who has made a table and sold it, they keep all of the money that they make. Whereas the person who works in a furniture factory owned by an industrialist, they make a table, the table is sold for however much the industrialist can get for it. The carpenter does not get the whole value of the table that is sold. They get a part of the value because the industrialist wants their cut, they want their percentage and then of course you have all the overheads of running the factory, the heating, the lighting and everything else that goes into running the factory and that those overheads have to be taken out of the value of the table. So that you reach the point where people are under an investment capitalist system getting paid for less than the value of the product they produce. The flip side of course is that for the cottage industry if the carpenter can't sell the table, no one wants to buy it, they go without money. Whereas if you work in a factory, even if the table doesn't get sold, you still get paid. So there's, there's gains and losses on either side. 
Weber argues that once we move beyond the cottage industry into investment capitalism, certain other factors kick in aside from the, such issues as payment and who decides the hours of operation, the hours of work, um, when you can have a coffee break and when you can have a lunch break and all the rest of it. So one of the factors that kicks in is efficiency. The cottage industry person is as efficient as they want to be, or indeed as inefficient as they want to be. Whereas if you work for an employer, they are the one who decides how efficient you should be. And if you fail to attain that level of efficiency, then you're likely to be shown the door. What is efficiency? Well, efficiency is, is the measurement of the amount of work put in and the output in terms of tables made or tins of beans sold in the supermarket or whatever it might be, a means of assessing input and output. Um, looking at ways to improve that process, to make it more efficient, to ensure that more is produced, more is sold, more money is made with the resources and the time and the skills and the knowledge and so forth available. How do people measure efficiency? Well, they start engaging in um, measurement processes. They measure the amount of time a person spends, an employee spends doing a certain activity. They measure the cost of raw materials. They measure uh, the cost or, or, or the, the financial gain, rather, of objects sold or services sold and how much income versus how much outcome. Once you get into the realm of measuring, that's where Weber argues we have the birth of bureaucracy. Record keeping monitoring, assessing, evaluating, comparing this month's figures to last month's figures to last year's figures, producing charts and graphs, keeping track of people, what they do, where they go. How long do they spend at lunch? Do they come back on time? If they need a toilet break, how long are they spending on their toilet break? Is that too long? Too long by whose standards? Is the output of employee A better or worse than the output of employee B? If it's better, can employee B be lifted up to the same standards as employee A? All of this monitoring, assessment, evaluation shapes bureaucracy. As investment capitalism maybe starts off by employing three people and then gets more successful, employs 10 people, gets more successful, employs 100 people, the bigger, the bigger, the bigger the shop or the factory or whatever the type of business happens to be becomes, the more complex and convoluted bureaucracy becomes. And then it reaches the point where there are individuals being employed to do nothing but bureaucratic assessments and record keeping. So they're not involved in the manufacture of tables and chairs, they're not on the shop floor as it were. They are sitting in offices, compiling records and keeping track of information. Once it reaches that stage, that's where Weber argues that the bureaucracy becomes self-perpetuating. People who create forms and paperwork to justify their own existence as bureaucrats. The forms get more and more complex, they get more and more extensive. The urge to chart and keep track of employees gets more and more extensive. It leads into what the French sociologist Michel Foucault termed surveillance culture, the wish to monitor people, to keep an eye on them, to see that they are doing what we think they are doing. It's why we have various organisations in modern day Britain like Ofsted to monitor what teachers do. And do they do it to the standard required of them? Who sets that standard? Well, it's not the individual teachers, nor is it even the, um, the, the head teacher or the principal of the school or the college in question. It's a person in Whitehall who sets these standards of what teachers across the country should be achieving and attaining. And likewise, you have other similar comparable monitoring organizations for other forms of profession to make sure people are doing what it is that they are meant to be doing according to the standards of a centralized bureaucracy not according to the standards of their own professionalism necessarily or to even to the standards of their immediate managers and employers 
but to a centralized standard. And of course, to do that, you're not simply monitoring one school, you're monitoring every school in the country. You're not monitoring one hospital, you're monitoring every hospital in the country. So the levels of bureaucracy required to monitor every school, every hospital, every factory, every shop, within a chain of shops, becomes phenomenally complex. Once bureaucracy achieves this level of, of almost perverse complexity, Weber argues that the people being monitored cease to be people. They just become units, numbers, figures on a page to be moved around. So if a particular employee is deemed not sufficiently efficient, they might be sacked. Does anyone monitoring these figures or issuing the orders care the impact on that individual if they're sacked for not being quite as efficient as the person stood next to them? Do they care if that person loses their home, if their marriage hits a rocky patch, if their children go hungry because of the lack of income, if they struggle to get another job? Is there any care or concern about the humanity of the individual involved? Probably not. And certainly the bigger the bureaucracy, the less and less likelihood is there to be any care about the impact on individual human beings who are being held to bureaucratic standards of performance and efficiency. And of course, these days, it's no longer only things like performance and efficiency. It's monitoring gender ratios, ethnic diversity, how many gay people, straight people, bisexual people you have in an organisation, where efficiency is not of the issue, but the, the monitoring of demographics and the decision to, re or we need more of this demographic or less of that demographic. The keeping track of demographics in itself is now an added layer of bureaucracy on top of measurements of efficiency. So again, the bureaucracy perpetuates and expands and expands and expands. And the humanity of the individuals involved is lost. What measures a good employee? Is it how happy they are? Is it how friendly and supportive they are of their fellow workers? Is it how um, kind and comparing and, and compassionate that they are as a human being? No. The likely measure in most bureaucracies, Weber argues, of the worth of a human being is how much wealth do they generate for their ultimate employer? Are they efficient? Efficiency, how much money do they generate? Are they working hard enough to generate more money than somebody else? Or are they money, less income, less financial value for the, the company, the business, the employer than the person next to them? Their humanity is lost. They simply become a, a unit, an object that produces wealth in one context or another. This obsession with efficiency, with wealth production, with monitoring and surveillance and bureaucracy, Weber argues these become almost like fervent religious virtues that must be adhered to and never questioned by those who are employed to maintain the bureaucracy. It, it retains that kind of religious air about it that he says were, were the roots of the Protestant work ethic within religion rather than within secularism. And so even though these days, and indeed in Weber's lifetime, little in these days, even though most um, forms of employment and company, are, they're, they're not run along religious lines or run by particular religious people necessarily, they're entirely secularized. Nonetheless, the passion, the fervor, the, the intensity with which doctrine must be adhered to and not questioned, Weber says has a, this sort of smattering of religiousness about it. We are now born into the cage because it's been in existence for, for longer than any human lifespan. We're born into this cage, into this steel shell. And when you're born into a cage, the question becomes for Weber and for a number of other people, do we even remember that we are or know, are we aware that we're in a cage? Is it rather like being a, a zoo animal where uh, a creature caught it in the wild and moved into a zoo knows that it's trapped. It can remember what it was like to be in the wild. 
a creature born in a zoo that has never been in the wild, has no knowledge of what it is like to be free. Therefore, they have nothing to compare their life in a cage to. Does that make it easier for the zoo animal? Less distressing if it has no memory of freedom, no sense of loss because it doesn't know what it's lost? Or is it likely to go just as mad and insane if it's born in the zoo than if it is abducted from the wild, captured from the wild? Is the same true of human beings if you're born to captivity? Um, let's take a, an extreme sample, someone who is born to slavery, who has never known what it is like to be a free man or a free woman. Is their slavery as burdensome than them as it would have been for perhaps their parent or grandparent or, or whoever who was born free? and at some point in their life abducted, and can remember what it was like to be free and feel the loss of it. Not an easy question to answer unless you engage in some extremely dubious experimentation. But Weber argues that once you're born in a cage, you, you kind of numb to it, you're inured to it. Like a fish in water, half the time you're not even aware that you are in water. It, it just becomes so second nature to you. One factor that um, Weber emphasizes, and it's something that Antonio Gramsci, the Italian sociologist, echoes and reiterates, is that this, this culture of um, containment, of restriction, of bureaucracy, of being monitored, of being measured, of being treated as nothing more important than a producer of wealth, where in which whether you're happy, sad, healthy, unhealthy, um, in love, alone and lonely, whatever, none of that matters compared to how much money you produce. Your sole defining value of a human being becomes your capacity to contribute money, not so much to your own bank account, but to the bank account of whoever employs you. And anything else fades into secondary, tertiary significance. Um, when you're born to that, you don't know any better. You're numb to it. You, after a while, you don't even think about it. It becomes second nature to you. But as both Weber and Gramsci argue, the system has to be perpetuated. It doesn't just happen. Each new generation of people have to be encouraged to continue perpetuate, not challenge, not seek to overthrow, not seek to escape from or ignore the system, but to actively participate in the system, to agree that being evaluated and measured and assessed is useful for them, is good for them, to agree being reduced to the level of pages and pages of paperwork, of boxes that must be ticked, that we are participants in a bureaucratic system is good for us. That there is some benefit to us of being monitored, of people knowing our race, our gender, our sexuality, our religion, and whatever else. That they need to know these details for reasons that are not only useful to them, but are also useful to us. That is a necessity to perpetuate the system. If you fail to indoctrinate each new generation, eventually the, the doctrine will die out, is the argument. So how does this um, process of indoctrination take place? How does it go on? Well, a key factor that Weber emphasizes is materialism. People must be convinced that the true measures of happiness are through wealth and the possessions that wealth buys. That those who have a lot of wealth and a lot of material goods are happier than, better off than, more important than those who have much less material goods and, and the wealth required to buy those material goods. Once each generation is convinced that joy comes through material possession, then both the carrot and the stick are created. The opportunity to make more wealth, to buy more possessions is dangled in front of them, to motivate them, to keep them going, to keep them wanting to participate. And when they achieve the wealth and the material possessions, it's reinforced. And if they fail to achieve the wealth and material possessions, it has to be emphasized that that is their 
fault, their failure, not the failure of the system or the failure of anybody else within the system, but their failure. The more materialistic a person becomes, the stronger the iron bars of the cage become, the stronger the steel shell becomes. Charles Taylor talks about the idea of a buffered self, that there is a, a wall between self and reality, the reality of the cosmos, of human existence, of all of the joys and the wonders and the horrors of human life. What is that wall, that buffer zone that keeps us from the outside world in all of its fullness and glory and, and horrors as well, because it's both good and bad? Well, Taylor argues materialism is, greed is, an appetite for possessions, for defining ourselves by our possessions. We purchase our identity. The philosopher Slavoj Žižek argues that one of the triumphs of capitalism, which he resents because he's a firebrand for Marxism, but one of the triumphs of capitalism is convincing people to buy their identities. We define ourselves by our possessions. But for some people, that's Gucci handbags and designer label clothing. For other people, it might be their politics. A t-shirt with a political slogan on it, whether that's the face of Che Guevara or um, a, an Extinction Rebellion badge pinned to your coat, or a, uh, a tote bag that says, this is what a feminist looks like. All of those are ways of marketing identity. Converting politics converting religion, converting tastes in music, in art, into sellable, purchasable, tradable goods that we can acquire, that define us in our own eyes to ourselves and define us to other people when they see the, see the goods that we own, the clothes that we wear, the labels on them, the badges, the jewelry, whether the badge is an Extinction Rebellion badge, or whether it's a crucifix worn around the neck, or whether it's a, a, a veil worn about the face, that all of these things have to be bought. There are markets, people who, whose careers are um, partially or wholly dependent on manufacturing such goods and retailing them to other people, so that we, we state our identity, and whether it's identity as a Christian, as a Muslim, as a hardline atheist, as a right-wing, left-wing, centrist, as, as a whatever it is that we identify as, we buy the goods that convey to other people, we are this thing. And having bought them, um, Slavoj Žižek's argument is that you don't necessarily need to actually follow it up by doing anything. From, for quite a lot of people, it's more than sufficient to state that you know, the feminism by wearing a badge or a slogan on a t-shirt. You don't actually have to do anything more than that. To state your ecological awareness by carrying a, a bag made of recycled materials with a label on it saying this bag is recycled. Do you actually have to do more than just buy the right stuff? Well, some people clearly take it further than that. But Zizek's point is that for larger and larger numbers of people, as long as they've bought the right stuff, that's about as far as their identity goes. It's a very surface level identity. And that's how the investment capitalism that Slavoj Žižek so resents triumphs by reducing identity to a surface level. Buy the right goods, job done, you don't need to think about it any more than that. And that purchased identity is a form of buffer between yourself and if you're religious, your soul, or if you're not religious, between yourself and, and um, existential anxiety and, and having a sense of who you truly are in the cosmos and the real nature of life, the universe and everything. As long as we go to work, we pay our taxes, we buy the right stuff, that's all we need to know. That is the buffer that keeps us contained, protects us from outer reality, and of course the cage is a shell, a buffer, a protection from the scariness of the big wide world. 
Weber says you can live in this for only so long before you experience Entzaubro, disenchantment. You realise that once you've bought the designer labels, once you've bought the t-shirts with political slogans on them, once you've draped the required religious jewellery or headdresses or whatever it happens to be upon yourself and done no more than that, and gone to work and filled in all your bureaucratic forms and been assessed by time and motion studies for efficiency or whatever it might be they're doing this week. Once you've gone through all of that, you realise how empty it is, how grey it is, how unfulfilling it is, and you become disenchanted with it. But you also become disenchanted with the wider world and indeed with yourself. Everything starts to look grey and dull and boring and empty and repetitive. That in itself is an illusion. The world is a wondrous place, but you can end up thinking it's not. You can end up thinking it's only dreary and grey and there's nothing more to life than trudging along to work every single day to do some repetitive task that you're bored to death with and earning enough money to hopefully buy your immediate needs, none of which are particularly fulfilling in and of themselves, and do the same again tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow until the day you either retire or drop dead, whichever happens first. It's not a very optimistic point of view, it has to be said. Although Weber and many of the other people we'll talk about as we go along were interested in finding ways to try and dismantle the iron cage, to help people get out of that iron cage and find the wonders and the joys of life, and then gradually, individual by individual, to change society in a way that would make it better for people, more fulfilling for people. Part of the process that Weber charts is what he terms value fragmentation. That there are societies over the course of history that have had core central values and um, pretty much everyone within that society has been aware of those values, have shared those values, and it's been a unifying factor within society. However, that doesn't persist over the course of the whole of history. For as we reach into the modern age, and into the period of time that both historians and sociologists refer to as modernism, what happens is value fragmentation. It starts to break apart. You get societies in which there are no longer consistent sets of values that almost everyone subscribes to. What you get are dozens of competing value systems, conflicting ideas, different political groups at each other's throats, arguing that this, this set of values or that set of values is better than the other one. Different religions, again, at each other's throats, arguing that this set of values or that set of values is better. Individuals within that system who don't know what the hell set of values they believe in anymore, who perhaps just drift from one fad to the next, to the next, to the next. Chaos ensues by this fragmentation, this splitting up of value systems until about the only value system that we are all obliged to follow through is the bureaucratic one, because it's nigh on impossible to go off grid and escape being assessed, evaluated, reduced to the level of a, a mound of paperwork. And of course, in the decades following Max Weber's death, we saw the beginning of the internet and now the full-on flourishing of the internet, where every thought, every action, every website visited is monitored and logged somewhere or another. Whether anyone ever pays attention to those logs is a whole other question, but they're monitored, but they're, they're there. They could be monitored if somebody wants to. Um, most of that monitoring is usually for the purposes, at least in the West, of working out what your purchasing habits are in order that companies can target you and convince you to buy even more stuff than you have previously bought, but there are also examples. China is a particularly frightening example of a government obsessed with monitoring its own people for their political ideologies, for their religious sympathies, and creating a um, points reward system where people are given points for pro-social behaviour, that is, 
behaviour approved of by the Chinese government, a bit debatable whether it is genuinely sociable, but it's approved of by the Chinese government, and likewise downmarked, downgraded for behaviour that is disapproved of by the Chinese government, which includes things like criticising the Chinese government. The lower your score becomes, the harder and harder it is to access services, to buy a train ticket and go somewhere, for example. It becomes a, a horrendously a disturbing system of social reinforcement and control, where those who fail to gain approval by the government are alienated and isolated and disenfranchised more and more and more until they learn to do as they're told and jump through the necessary hoops, gain the necessary approvals, and move up in terms of their grading in order to be able to access the basic services that once upon a time they could have freely accessed. What's being rolled out in China could potentially be rolled out in other parts of the world, and we could well argue that social media clearly does that to a sense anyway, through the system of clicking likes and, and other methods for people to express their approval or disapproval of what someone has posted or said or written on social media. It gains and loses kudos, uh, not just in terms of clicking a few buttons, but someone who expresses an opinion that one day is deemed to be politically unpopular, and I don't just mean with governments, but with um, members of various uh, for example, identity politics movements who decide that somebody has said something, maybe even something that they said years and years and years ago on social media. They've written a post or uh, said something somewhere that is now deemed to be sexist or racist or homophobic or Islamophobic or some other phobic. And that individual is then hounded, not by sinister governments, but hounded by individual citizens who gang together to express their contempt for the viewpoint that has been expressed. People have lost jobs, people have become estranged from families, people have had bricks through windows where it's moved offline and into the real world because of this sort of gang mentality almost like a witch hunt, denouncing the unbeliever, denouncing the heretic. And again, there is this rather fervent religious overtone to an awful lot of what goes on social media in the West. So we're going to even have to just point the finger at the Chinese government because we have plenty enough individuals over here willing to engage in pretty much the same sorts of controlling, demanding, haranguing behaviours that the Chinese government is engaged in. So one might wonder quite how long it will be before this becomes official policy in the West, the way it has in China. Hopefully never, but you, you got to wonder. Weber uses the language of religion quite a lot, um, including notions around polytheism and monotheism. Now, when he's talking about polytheism, a bit like Frederick Schiller um, extolling the virtues of ancient Greece, he's not doing so as a genuine believer, the way someone in ancient Greece who genuinely believed Zeus and Apollo and Athena and so on existed as actual gods and goddesses. He's not doing it in that way. Rather, just like Schiller, he is seeing these gods as embodiments of virtues and ideas and concepts and values. So polytheism, lots of gods and goddesses, is to have lots of values. Now, Weber and some other people refer to the pantheons of ancient Greece and Rome and Egypt and so forth as representing values in conflict. And certainly you can look at the mythology of these ancient societies and see gods scheming and fighting with each other, um, what appears to be conflicts between gods. Uh, and so this becomes interpreted from the viewpoint of people like Weber as symbolic of conflicts between value systems. And the movement from polytheism to monotheism, from a multitude of ancient gods and goddesses towards the one singular god of Christianity in the West and the one singular god of, Christ of Islam in the East, 
is seen as a move from multiple values to a single dominant value, a single meta-narrative, a single story within society, that all other competing values and, and stories and narratives and gods have been discounted and one has become the central focus of society, which um, Weber sees as a precursor to the dominance of investment capitalism as the new non-religious, the atheist narrative. So the, the one God is replaced by the one economy. It's still the dominance of one, except it's now articulated in a secular way, as a secular value system, rather than as a religious value system. But the further the passion, the intensity, the obedience to the rules and regulations has all of the atmosphere of a religion still with it, it's just a kind of secularized religion, in a sense. Now, for those people of the ancient world, and indeed there are people in the modern world who still do, regard polytheism as real, that it's not simply a set of, of um, symbolic values, but actual gods and goddesses, their interpretation of the stories involving conflict between gods and goddesses was understood in a different light. But we'll try not to get into the theology too much because the focus here needs to be more on sociology and psychology rather than theology. There are other people coming at it from other angles who have um, taken up the cudgels in similar sorts of veins, though with slight twists. The American philosopher Michael Sandel, who is by no stretch of the imagination a Marxist, um, nonetheless, which are secular arguments, economic arguments, in this context at least, deal with the idea that human beings have lots of values. If you want to put that into a Weberian context, lots of gods with a small g. These values are reasons to engage in activities. Why might someone engage in an activity? Well, I could pick up a book and I could read that book because I enjoy it. It's fun. I like it. I enjoy the story. I might not earn any money in the period of time it takes me to read that book. I might not necessarily gain any great intellectual knowledge or, or anything like that from a book. It's just a fun book and I enjoy it. And as far as Michael Sandel is concerned, there's absolutely nothing wrong in that because fun is a perfectly acceptable motivation. It's a perfectly acceptable value. Do something because it's fun and pleasurable and you enjoy doing it. Nothing wrong with that at all. Equally, I could go and read some intellectually improving book on philosophy. And I might find the style of writing a bit boring and not very enjoyable, perhaps. But I gain intellectual knowledge from it. I gain stimulation. And again, Sandel says, brilliant, perfect, nothing wrong with that at all. Intellectual stimulation, perfectly acceptable. Good motivation. If you want to go down Weber's route and start drawing analogies with mythology or, or follow Schiller's route in the same vein, you could say intellectual stimulation, well, that could be like the goddess Athena in Greek myth, the goddess of intellect and learning and knowledge, or doing something because it's fun could be like Dionysus, the god of, of wine and theatre and, and partying and fun. There are other reasons to do things. I could read a cookbook because I want to gain practical knowledge. It may not be very intellectually stimulating. It might not be fun in the sense that a murder mystery novel is fun, but I want to learn a practical skill, how to cook a particular recipe. So I read the book and the gain that I acquire from the time spent in reading that cookbook is the knowledge, the practical set of skills of how to cook a particular recipe. Nothing wrong with that. Completely sensible, pragmatic sort of thing. A bit like the goddess um, Hestia, the goddess of the hearth. Practical, sensible, worthwhile. I might in, read a book to my nephew. Bit of storytelling, I might be bored by the book, but I know my nephew enjoys it. So I read that storybook, book at bedtime type thing to him. And why am I doing it? I'm doing it out of love for a member of the family. So even if I don't especially enjoy the book myself, I know 
the nephew does, and therefore it becomes a, a, an act of kindness and doing something for reasons of love, for reasons of kindness, perfectly acceptable. As far as Sendo is concerned. I could, of course, go and, um, well, let, let's say, teach a class, an hour's class, on a subject that bores me to death, but I do it because I've been paid my hourly rate to teach that class and I want the money. Perfectly acceptable, perfectly okay, as far as Michael Sandel is concerned. Now, the critique that Sandel is making is that in a healthy functioning society in which people are in a good mental state and so forth, acknowledges this multitude of values, is happy that there are people doing things out of love and other people doing things for fun and other people doing things for practical skills and other people doing things for money. And the same individual can shift and chop and change three dozen times over in the course of a day for doing different activities for different reasons. That's the sign of a healthy society. The sign of an unhealthy society is one in which people are required, expected, assumed to only do things for one particular reason. And the reason he says that has become more and more dominant, bordering on the moral value uh, as a, a kind of a singular dominant value in society is the motivation of money. The assumption that people will only or should only do things for money. And therefore, if there's no money involved, why the hell are they wasting their time? That's the problem he has. There is nothing wrong in doing something for money as long as that motivation coexists with all those other motivations in an individual or in a society. The problem comes when you're only expected to do things for one reason, as if that reason, the wish to make money, is more important than any other possible reason you could do anything for. That one god, the god of money, becomes more important than any other god to whom you might bend your knee or value system to which you might give attention, honour and respect. The Portuguese poet Fernando Pessoa, in one of his poems, has a line which says, In every corner of my soul is an altar to a different god. And he may not have been taken, I mean, I, very little is known about his actual religious sensibilities, but he probably wasn't taking that too literally. But rather this idea that he, that there is a, a devotion to art, a devotion to music, a devotion to family, a devotion to friends, a devotion to earning money, a devotion to health. All of these factors that you might devote yourself to are good things. And a healthy, well-rounded person moves between different values, different factors in their life. They're not obsessed with one thing and one thing only. And the danger becomes, and you may feel Sandel is right, or you may feel he's over-exaggerating, um, the danger becomes modern society in America, he's an American, he's talking about American society, but is the same true of British society, or French, German, Italian, Chinese, Spanish society? Have we become obsessed with money to the exclusion of virtually everything else? Or do we incorporate as individuals, as societies, other factors? Do we understand that other people have other value systems? So to give an example, the, the kind of thing that Weber would have been worried and concerned about, an employer, a boss says to his employees or her employees, um, I need you to work late to get this, this job done and finished by the deadline. I need you to stay on late. And maybe I'll pay you extra or what have you. So there is an investment. The reason you need to stay on late is as workers, I will pay you extra hours, I'll pay you overtime. The money motivation. And there are plenty of people will have done, been in exactly that situation, perhaps both from the employee side and some people from the employer side. And per se, there is nothing wrong in that. Unless, of course, it becomes a very, very regular feature of employment at that company, where again and again and again and again, the person is being asked to stay late, stay late, stay late. 
as if the opportunity to earn money or get promotion or whatever other fiscally related benefit they're being offered is more important than going home and being with their family or going down the pub and being with their friends or going to church or to mosque or to synagogue or just sitting at home and watching telly or reading a book or doing whatever on earth it is that they might be doing instead of staying late at work that the chance to earn more money is more important than anything else in the mind of the person making the request or issuing the order as the case may be depending on how domineering they are as a boss that's where it becomes problematic where the employer forgets that their employees also have a life outside of work they have family they have friends they have concerns about their health they have hobbies at least you hope they do um, they may have religion they may have politics they may have this that and the other they may have all these other altars in different corners of their soul that they want to go and spend time before paying attention to these other factors in their life doing things for fun doing things for intellectual stimulation doing things for all sorts of reasons and not wanting to spend every waking minute at work earning money that's the kind of concern that both Sandel has and Weber has and various other people have that it becomes too dominant the Israeli philosopher Yuval Noah Harari um, has, has put forward the argument that money is the new uber religion and it doesn't matter if you are Christian or Buddhist or Hindu or a Shintoist or an atheist or an agnostic the one thing that practically everybody on this planet believes in with very few exceptions is the power of money it crosses all known borders left wing right wing centrist money speaks all languages we have faith that these little metal discs and bits of paper and imaginary electronic blips on a screen are worth something are worth our time giving up our time for are worth learning things we may not be terribly interested in to acquire more money are worth exchanging goods for that if we go into a shop and we see a can of beans is worth 65p that notion of 65 pence means something objective and if a tin of custard is also worth 65p then somehow the beans and the custard are equivalent to each other in terms of their worth and value in some abstract sense that this is almost like a faith and just as once upon a time many people would spend their sundays going to church so nowadays you're more likely to see large swathes of people turning up with this back in the days before coronavirus large swathes of people turning up at shopping centers to traipse mindlessly round the aisles and instead of putting their their coins on the collection plate at the church they put their money in the till and it almost becomes like this sort of religious devotion and banks the new temples bankers and economists the new priests and lay priests of the temples it goes into somewhat um, purple prose describing money and, and economics as as acts of faith that somebody says well i think this economic system will work better than that economic system often with very little practical evidence for either statement and it becomes an act of faith in an economic notion a uh, system of economics a way of running an economy if communal values shared values by almost everyone in a community start to break down what you get is lots of individual competing values this bunch of people value this thing that bunch of people value another thing even though they all live in the same society and so you get fracturing and, and splintering between groups and indeed we could argue and certainly Weber has argued and others have argued that the ultimate end of individualism which is a key feature of modernism that we no longer think of ourselves in the collective as members of communities but we think of ourselves as individuals 
or at least many people, not everyone necessarily does. Within Judaism, for example, you have the notion of Chilul Hashem and Chilul Kadesh, where if one Jewish person behaves well, it brings up the reputation of the entire Jewish community. And if one Jewish person behaves badly, it brings down the reputation of the entire Jewish community. So the individual is part of the community and their actions, good or bad actions, cannot be seen in isolation, but must be seen as having an impact on all other Jewish people for good or for bad. So some people have that sort of collective outlook, but more and more and more what you get is individualism, where my values are my values and they're not even necessarily shared with other members of my family, let alone next door neighbours, let alone people in the same town or people in the same country. You get individualism rather than collectivism. And Weber and others question how ultimately good that is as an approach. Will it cause more problems than benefits in the long term? What, what's the, the ongoing impact of this fracturing down to the singular unit of the individual? Now, people on the political right, um, going back to Ayn Rand as an example of this, say that the, the central minority, when she was talking about um, during the era of civil rights and women's rights and so on, of various different groups saying well, the, the rights of this group versus the rights of that group, and like minority rights and so on. Her argument is the absolute bedrock minority is the individual. For her, the, the chief doctrine is the doctrine of ultimate individualism, which kind of influences Margaret Thatcher's um, statement that there is no society, there are just individuals. It boils down to the one person. Not everyone on the right goes along with that. There are others within the sort of ethno-nationalist right who um, look rosy spectacled upon the days or in which most people within any, any given country or community tended to be of the same religion, tended to be of the same ethnicity. The, the odd one or two people from minority communities, but by and large, the bulk of people would have been from the same background. And they look on those days with a sort of, I say, rosy spectacled chocolate box glow and wish it could be reintroduced, which tends to lead to tensions between groups within multiculturalism. So you, you've got various different approaches as to what's good, what's bad in this sociological, political context. So if people no longer necessarily share universal values of a given religion or of a given um, cultural set of values, what are the alternatives? What tends to crop up instead? Well, Noah, you, uh, sorry, Yuval Noah Harari has already made this argument. We just mentioned the worship of money is perhaps more unifying than any other factor. And one of his arguments is that not so much religions will die out per se, but that there will be a massive um, transformation, um, technology being one of the keys to this, the kind of reverence of technology, which you could say is and of itself a, a, a sort of semi-religious devotion. And uh, this notion that somehow technology will save us from problems, even if half the problems are caused by technology. Um, that's one element of his argument, but the other element is this financial aspect that money crosses all other boundaries, race, politics, religion, etc., etc., and unifies people. And therefore, this, this kind of reverencing of money becomes a centralized factor of people who will do, or what should I say, only do things if there is a financial incentive in it. And the list of things that they will only do if they get money out of it gets longer and longer and longer and starts to include the kinds of things that Michael Sandel says should absolutely not be on that list. Things that we should be doing for those other kinds of values that I mentioned in connection with Michael Sandel earlier, like love and fun and intellectual stimulation and so forth. There is also arguably the cult of celebrity, this, this adulation of the rich and famous, or even just the famous, even if they're not necessarily always rich, but they are famous. Um, devotion to people, whether that's Hollywood actors and celebrities or Bollywood or Nollywood or, or whichever part of the world we're looking in, 
or people who are prominent politicians, famous authors, there's not too many of them, most authors are relatively obscure, famous sports stars, people in reality TV who appear to be famous despite having absolutely no measurable talent whatsoever, but have become famous nonetheless. And the burgeoning number of youngsters, there's been various psychological and sociological studies done in this way, the burgeoning number of youngsters who report that their main ambition is no longer to be a train driver or an astronaut or a doctor or the kind of things that people wanted to be 50 odd years ago. Their main ambition is to be famous. And it pretty much does not matter to them what they're famous for, as long as they're famous. So it's not as if they want to be famous singers or famous actors or famous writers. They just want to be famous. And this is one of the horrors of reality TV. People are famous for nothing. They're just famous. Do we treat the famous as almost like demigods, figures of worship and adulation? To the point where when someone we have never met in our lives dies, they'll be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Not the kind of moderate sorrow you might feel, how sad for their family, how sad for their friends, who I'll miss not being able to read their books anymore, or not being able to see them in new films and TV shows but rather outright grief, as if this is the, the death of a loved one, even though you've never met them. And had you met them, you might not have liked them, actually, when you saw what the real person was like away from the screen, away from their state of celebrity. But they're, they're idolised nonetheless. Is narcissism, technology-enabled narcissism, one of the new key values and that certainly is an argument made by quite a number of sociologists that the ultimate end goal of individualism, why I say end goal, end consequence of individualism and the cult of individualism is narcissism, where nothing could be more important than me. What I think, what I feel, what I believe. And of course, we see a lot of this with social media, where complete numpties get into arguments with recognised experts because the complete numpty is of the opinion that their ill-informed view on the subject has to be far more important than the well-informed view of someone with a lifetime of experience and knowledge and study in a given area. And so the cult of me becomes more important. I want to do something and if it upsets everyone else, tough luck on them, I am more important than them and their sorrow and their grief and their anxiety, where the only yardstick of anything becomes me and my wishes, my whims, my urges. And lots of new age um, movements tend to centre around this idea that um, all the knowledge I need in life is already inside me. I don't need to look anywhere else or listen to anyone else. It's all me, me, me. All I need to do is sit here and stare at my own fundament until I find the inner revelation of my own wonderfulness. This sort of idea becomes unrelenting and, and widespread. Is it more widespread now than a thousand years ago? Well, that's very difficult to argue because we don't have measurements for how widespread that view was a thousand years ago. But it certainly feels, even within the course of an individual lifetime, as if it is becoming widespread, more widespread. There are lots of other things we could argue have become the sort of value systems, competing factional value systems of a, a new and rather discordant world, rather than unifying value systems that bring people together. There is that social element which um, people like Ninian and Smart have argued within religion, in religious studies, that religion through ritual and ceremony and festival brings people together. So they all come together for Easter or for Christmas or for Eid or whatever the, the particular religious festival happens to be in that particular religion. And they celebrate, they worship, they turn up at places, they eat meals together, they chat together, they share a common story together that's centred on the story of Christmas, the story of Easter, the story of whatever it may be, Buddha's enlightenment, what have you. They share that story together and it becomes a unifying bonding force. And you do get people who bond over stories in a secularized context. People who adore Game of Thrones or Doctor Who or whatever it may be, and they bond over that story. And then sometimes, just as in religion, there are schisms and fractions 
where uh, a new level layer of a story is brought in and there are people who love the new layer and people who hate it and prefer the earlier older layer of the story and factionalize and schism over it but that is again fueled by i like this story and i will bond with other people who like this story so there is the individualism there rather than it being something that unifies an entire community with a set of values associated with the story and the rituals and the ceremonies and the practices and so forth associated with the story that was the bonding in many parts or still is let's face it the bonding feature within religious stories that you don't quite get in secularized comparable notions so does this lead to ultimate social discord potentially Gramsci we've already mentioned made the argument um, another Marxist passionately against investment capitalism but the same argument even if you're not a Marxist even if you are a, a very anti-Marxist this element of his argument can be taken and run with that systems survive and perpetuate themselves by creating a hegemony that is to say a, a kind of a cultural immersion when so much of a particular way of thinking is present in life and reinforced and reinforced and it's collectively reinforced in other words it's not just people in authority beating the younger generation over the head until they agree the younger generation have got to get on board with it have got to willingly engage with it and because you have this process of willing and mutual engagement between older generations and younger generations the culture the system perpetuates and once it perpetuates to a sufficiently widespread degree people forget there are alternatives it feels natural it feels normal it feels as if there couldn't be any other way of living but this and you know, the paucity in teaching of history can be a factor in that people might not know that there was ever another way of being except this one and maybe sometimes there's an investment in ensuring that those elements of history are not taught in order to ensure people don't know that there was an alternative so they make a question the current system now whilst Gramsci was railing against capitalism as an example of this you we could equally say in China or in the days of communist Russia communism exists through hegemony through immersing the people within those countries in the the idea that there could never be an alternative to the system and it's reinforced and reinforced and reinforced and so we could say the same of the iron cage of bureaucracy and the iron cage of relentless work and relentless materialism that we never think about another way of being we are so immersed in it but we have to be convinced to want it that this is a good thing it's for our benefit and we we take some pleasure from it so the, the pleasures of shopping, for example, um, whether you are a, a skinny young thing like the women in those pictures or whatever age or sex or, or shape you are, you, we are all engaged in the joys of shopping, in ordering things online and, and so on. These days in lockdown and, and more conventional forms of shopping as well, um, pre and post lockdown people define themselves by their possessions how much stuff they own how much stuff they acquire all the things we've already said it's a means of perpetuating the system if you pull away from the system you can't then afford to go shopping because you don't have the resources to do it you might be deeply happy in other ways in the kinds of ways that uh, michael sandel describes doing things for fun doing things out of love doing things out of intellectual stimulation none of which will put necessarily money in your bank account with which to go shopping but might give you a fulfilling life in other non-materialist ways but the the nature of nature rather of this self-perpetuating cage is that it, it discourages questioning it discourages thought of alternate possibilities and the, the systems through which a culture perpetuates itself art theater literature sports all of the kinds of things that we all engage in that have to be understood in a certain way in a certain light um, it perpetuates so the cage the cage is not imposed upon us we willingly embrace it and see it as a good thing and a discouraged from ever questioning that this this 
the restrictive and suffocating cage exists. Weber's quote there, um, in Baxter's view, the care for external goods should only lie on the shoulders of the saint like a light cloak which can be thrown aside at any moment, but fate decreed that the cloak should become an iron cage. The Baxter in question he's referring to is a Puritan philosopher from a few hundred years ago. Um, he was effectively saying that you know, materialism, well, owning uh, and possessions, earning money is all well and good, but it should be a, a light thing rather than a defining feature of life. But, says Weber, we've now reached the point in Weber's lifetime, but in now, when earning money and owning possessions becomes the dominant factor, the suffocating restrictive factor that locks people into a cage rather than um, is something that they can put aside in order to pursue spiritual calling or intellectual calling or doing things for love and joy and family and friendship and, and all that sort of thing. Everything has to become measured in terms of materialism and money. Is he right? This is where it will be most out of debate. But you can always pause, have a coffee, mull it over, think about it, and then come back and listen to the rest. Once you've had a chance to mull and think what your view is, not only of how the world was in Max Weber's lifetime, but how it is today. Weber flags up, as we mentioned a few times already, that um, the move from polytheism to monotheism, from multiple values to a singular value, and then from a singular religious value, monotheism, to a singular secular value, investment capitalism, and nowadays, of course, neo neoliberalism as a dominant force is part and parcel of secularism and that secularism would not have been possible without monotheism in the first place and the notion of a dominant singular value. Um, that secularism is no less a dominant perpetuating ideology than uh, religious monotheism was or indeed religious polytheism was before that. With it, with secularism comes the rise of science, of rationalism, of the argument within rationalism that all things can be explained and understood eventually with sufficient research and sufficient study, that a rational answer can be understood and found in all things, that humans are at bedrock rational creatures, logical creatures, and there are others who counter that actually would not, that for human beings rationalism, logic, is the light cloak that can be cast aside, and that at bedrock we are intensely emotional subjective impulsive creatures who only have this sort of light layer of rationalism on top of us. There is this anxiety, not so much with Weber, but um, in subsequent philosophers that have come after Weber, that we are moving towards a, a sort of cybernetic state of humanity as technology and science gets more and more and more sophisticated and implants into the human body become more and more viable not just in terms of things like um, pacemakers and things of that nature but computer implants whereby information can be uploaded and downloaded directly into the human body we will move to a point where the human flesh fuses with computer technology and we become more like robots. Some people have argued that as robots become more and more sophisticated and more and more capable of independent thought, will they eventually just replace us entirely? And maybe at that juncture there will be an attempt to try and convert human consciousness into a computer code that could be shifted into a robot brain and uh, a robot body rather than a flesh and blood body. It might all be fantasies of science fiction that never come to pass, or rather out there, um, but more and more people are concerned that this is becoming a viable possibility and that we will lose our humanity entirely and become so rationalist that we in fact turn into machines. All a bit grim. Um, one of the arguments around rationalism, or against rationalism, 
is that the more rational we become, the more things are explained, the less sense of wonder and mystery there is. Now, not everyone goes with that, and we look at some of the counter arguments momentarily. But one of the people who does go along with that is Maurice Berman, uh, who argues that a, a, a consequence of this march towards both secularism and rationalism is that disenchantment that ends our that sense that the world becomes greyer and drearier and more boring, not because it is boring, but because our mental attitude to the world is to think of it as boring, and we become distanced from it, we become buffered from it. We cease to view the world as a place of wonder, a place of mystery, a place of, of profound spiritual um, attunement and instead we see it as mechanistic as dull as drag as dreary as tediously predictable and with that point of view Berman says you get high depression rates hyped rates in people on antidepressive medication as we no longer care about the natural world and the wonders of forests and jungles and oceans scapes and so on we treat it more and more and more shoddily and we end up with the sorts of environmental devastation we now have. Suicide rates go up as people experience what Durkheim referred to as anony, that sense of alienation and estrangement, not only from the natural world, but from each other. Now, Morris Berman is American and in his book on disenchantment, he um, presents statistics for Americans um, in terms of prescription rates for Prozac and things like that. I thought it might be more interesting to give you some British um, statistics rather than American statistics. But the contention is much the same because he says in America the, the rate of people on antidepressive medications and um, people suffering and seeking medication to help cope with their alienation from the world has skyrocketed over the course of time of recent years has just gone through the roof and he puts that down to there being more depression as opposed to just the diagnosis being better or indeed being overly sensitive to diagnosis and also that this is kind of what is the rationalist response to depression medicate people rather than say help them attune to the spiritual wonders of life and cut back on the amount of work they're doing and go out and hug a tree or spend time with people they love or, or being artistic and creative and tuning to the world in very spiritual ways the, the response is to treat the human condition as if we are biological machines and when the machine gets 40 it needs a biological chemical repair so these comparable figures from this country, you could say fit well with what Berman is arguing. Um, so in that 2017-18 period, um, 7.3 or over 7.3 million GP patients in England alone, that's not including Scotland and, and Wales and Northern Ireland, were put on antidepressant medications. 4.4 million, as you can see there, um, had been on a prescription for um, at some point, not necessarily consistently for the entirety of the two years, but had for at least part of the previous two years also been on the same medication. So this was an ongoing one. Um, and there, 1.6 million people um, had only just started on uh, antidepressant medications. Now, the question we can't answer, because we don't know who these people are, but we could potentially ask, is were all of these people depressed because they had chemical imbalances in their brain? Or were they depressed because of circumstances in their life? That could be things like death, bereavements, um, major tragedies and problems that could happen to absolutely anyone. Or are the arguments made by people like Berman and Weber valid here that maybe we have created such an inhuman society in which people are reduced to the level of cogs in machines, trudging to work, spending huge amounts of time at work, trudging back, paying taxes, filling in forms, and it's grey and it's dreary and it's repetitive and it is soul destroying that the ultimate consequence is that huge numbers of people are miserable and depressed whether they're on medication or not is a secondary issue but they are miserable and from Weber's point of view from Berman's point of view 
if the causation of their misery is this disenchantment and alienation from society in their own life as everything fractures down and money becomes the great end all and be all, then the treatment, the solution is not medicating people up to the eyeballs. The treatment or solution is to revolution in society and make it a more joyful place in which we can have a sense of wonder and mystery and magic and, and joy in life rather than just trudge, trudge, trudge on the rat race. Or are they being rosy spectacled and idealistic and naive? And maybe medication is the right way to go. A very difficult one to answer that for certain. But um, there's, there would appear to be an issue here because as well as those 7.3 million prescriptions back then, um, we have to factor into account that that is just prescriptions given by GPs in the NHS. That doesn't include um, prescriptions given to prisoners, prescriptions delivered to people who are in hospital for whatever other reason, um, including psychiatric hospitals as well as mainstream general hospitals, nor does it include any of the people getting their prescriptions outside the NHS from private doctors. So the actual number of people on antidepressants during that period of time would have been somewhat higher than 7.3 million. Has it gone down now we're into 2020? I don't have statistics to quote you, but I wouldn't suggest holding your breath that it has gone down. I think it may have gone up with the current situation that people are experiencing. Is Berman and, and Weber and those various other people, are they correct to say that a key factor for not everyone, but for many people in this depression is that sense of alienation, of anime? caused by the way society runs in the first place? Or do you think they're being naive? There is one for discussion and debate. Another quote from Weber here, it was on the side of his photo. The fate of our times is characterized by rationalization and intellectualization, and above all, by the disenchantment of the world. Precisely the ultimate and most sublime values have retreated from public life either into the transcendental realm of mystic life or into the brotherliness of direct and personal human relations. It is not accidental that our greatest art is intimate and not monumental. So the retreat into mystic life, um, during Max Weber's lifetime, there were quite a few um, esoteric and occult lodges starting up and various offshards of Christian mysticism mostly populated by the well-to-do and the well-heeled girl and by anyone else. Um, so that was, it was kind of burgeoning as in, it's still mystical, it's still religious, but it's not mainstream. It's not the, the, the previously existing forms of religion. It's this sort of minority sects and schisms and so forth. Um, the, the brotherliness of direct personal human relations, people still being in love with their other halves, what well, you hope most of the time, um, with their children, parents, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, whatnot, um, family relations, but it being confined to a small scale family relation rather than a sort of a wider sense of philanthropy and, and community connection of the grander scale that arguably um, Weber and various other people have suggested was more common in earlier periods of history where people were encouraged to look after each other as a village or as a town and sort of feel a sense of togetherness with a whole congregation of people to whom they were not related. Now it has retreated just to your immediate blood relationships. Or at least that's what they were saying in his lifetime. Whether it's still the case now, that's where we can debate and discuss all this. You can debate and discuss and think about it in that context. Uh, if you're wondering about the peculiar picture here, that's meant to be an ent from Lord of the Rings. Uh, the, the, the walking tree people. So Berman says, we shouldn't drown ourselves in doom and gloom and despair and negativity, that there are positives to be had, there are optimistic things to be had, because there are ways out of this situation. That which has been disenchanted can, if we all pull together and work on it, be re-enchanted. The magic can be brought back. The sense of wonder can be brought back. And Berman looks at just just as um weber there was mentioning these um 
mystical lodges that were resurging in his lifetime. So Berman is looking at a kind of new age mysticism, neo-paganism, um, various religious sects of different types and flavors, all of these sorts of things resurging, not to say that they are all good things, uh, and that they're not, that he's by no means saying that there aren't criticisms to be made, but that rather these are examples of that deep rooted human urge for wonder. And the more secular and rational and um, arid mainstream society becomes, the more Berman says you see these offshoots cropping up, some of them good, some of them horrendous, but these offshoots cropping up, which articulate people's deep rooted urge to want wonderment and enchantment and magic. And that what society ultimately needs to do is, is redesign itself, overhaul itself to reincorporate a sensible, safe, structured, um, useful, productive form of enchantment rather than some of the more weird, wackier, dodgier forms of enchantment. And sticking in the same vein, could we not look at the massive popularity of fiction, whether it's TV shows or films or novels or what have you, in which we are either getting wizards or time-travelling aliens or, or dragons or uh, vampire battling um, teenage sort of super heroines, whatever it is that we're getting in these various different forms of manifestations, the amount of time and money and the number of people who watch films and the TV shows and buy the books and buy the merchandise, um, which again, um, Zizek would say is the sign of capitalism triumphing. It's providing people with wonderment, but at a price tag. The wonderment you get from wandering in the woods and, and seeing um, animal life and plant life and what have, have you does not involve a price tag. This is commercialized wonderment. So Zizek would be a little bit cynical and jaded. Um, but again, you could say as per Berman, not only is it people perhaps joining curious and unusual religious and new age sects, but it's also just people sitting in front of the TV and wanting, yearning for wonder and mystery and magic and, and the bizarre, the peculiar, the, the engaging, the entertaining, the things that give a sense that life is about more than just drudging, earning money, paying in taxes and filling in interminable forms, that there is something deeper and more magical. And that includes things like friendship and love and intimacy between the various characters that form the, the human angle of these stories, but also that sense that the universe is a fantastical place and we should be open to the fantastical. Now, aside from Zizek's likely argument around the commercialization going on here, we could also say that there is a, a buffering in that these forms of wonder have the safety of being fake. They're fiction. We know they're fiction when we're watching them or reading them or whatever. Um, it's not the same as going and sitting on a mountain top or wandering through a deep, dark forest when the wolves are howling. Not like this country, obviously, but in some parts there. Um, and the sense of wonder that would have been experienced by our distant ancestors of engagement with the numinous, with the profound, with the spiritual, with its intendant risks, because wonderment is not safe. And this is part and parcel of the cage, the promise of safety, of neutralizing risk, of neutralizing danger. But what the, the benefit you get, or at least it's packaged as a benefit, of being in the cage is that you will be safe. Nothing is going to happen to you except dying or born. Um, whereas true wonderment, not the type you get off a TV screen or from a novel, but the true wonderment that you get from being out there comes with risks. And it's really in the sense of risk that opens you up because that age of fear and anxiety and uncertainty, wonder comes from the unknown, not the safe, the known, the measured, the quantifiable, but from the unknown, the mysterious, the uncertain. And when it's unknown, there is always that element of potential danger there. So this, you could say, as much as I'm a great lover of Harry Potter and Doctor Who and so, um, you could argue that there is an element of the anodyne here, that it is safe. 
that whether it's dark wizards or Daleks or whatever it might be, we know sitting on our backsides watching it on a screen or reading it in a novel, that nothing is actually going to happen to us as consumers of this sort of synthetic wonder. Now, you see, I'm not about to say we shouldn't enjoy this because I personally do enjoy many of these genres, but to say that if we're, we're going with the arguments of Berman and, and Weber and others that alongside the synthetic wonder, there must also be the real thing. That the synthetic can never be a replacement for the real thing. Not everyone agrees, needless to say. Um, so Jason Joseph and Storm puts forward a disagreement around the idea of disenchantment per se, of saying actually he doesn't think the, the world has been disenchanted. That yes, you, you've had chops and changes in mainstream religion and the growth in science and so on, but the sense of wonder, of mystery, of magic, of oddity has always been there. And just as, as Berman um, cites these various New Age groups and, and sort of mystical offshoots within mainstream religion, they're nothing new, is Joseph and Saul's point. These have always been there, even as the dark satanic mills were built up and the Industrial Revolution turned ancient forests into slag heaps and transformed the world in a rather grim dark place, grim dark way, even whilst that was happening, the yearning for the mysterious and the magical and the wonderful was still there. It didn't go away. People still go to church, to synagogue, to mosque, to Mandir, to Gudvada. They still do that in large numbers, not as large a number in Britain as, as it used to be, but in many other parts of the world still in tremendously large numbers. And even in Britain, where church attendance is not today what it used to be 100 years ago, even so, you have people interested in all sorts of weird and wondrous things and engaging with them in their own ways, maybe not mainstream ways, maybe not ways that have that kind of socially bonding collectivist element of mainstream religion, but they're engaging in it nonetheless. It's just changing in how it happens. People still believe in wondrous, strange and mystical things, whether that's astrology or aliens or trans-dimensional beings or, or whatever the thing is, they still have this sense of wonderment. James Roy King looks at both the good and the bad side of enchantment, and the good sides we've mentioned a bit already. The bad sides he flags up uh, is this notion that enchantment, as it's presented in you know, fairy tales and, and um, literature and so forth, is the idea of being almost hypnotised, of misled, enchanted, uh, convinced that something is wonderful when actually it isn't. And so you get the kinds of stories that used to be popular, still are popular actually, um, in fairy tales in previous centuries. Uh, a common type of a story often involves a musician or somebody else possessed of a skill who is led into fairyland and they play music or do whatever it is that they do for the fairies and then they get rewarded with a big bag of gold and they run home terribly excited. And when they get home, they open the bag of gold and they find that this wonderful gift is nothing but a load of dried up old leaves. The enchantment has worn off as soon as they leave fairyland and the reality of it is cheap and tawdry. And so you could say there's a lot of things people get enchanted by, which would include things like religious sects and, and some of the new age movements and, and some of the um, technological fads and scientific fads and so on, which look wondrous, but are misleading and the, the glamour wears off and you end up with a handful of nothing worth much of anything in the first place. And so glamour enchantment is not always a good thing. Sometimes it turns out to be not worth the effort. And we need to be a little bit more sensible. And drawing towards the end now, we have a, a, a more pronounced counter-argument from Richard Dawkins, who says you can have all of that wonder and glory and enchantment, but in a scientific context rather than a mystical context. So it's sort of similar arguments that Patrick Moore used to make and um, Brian Cox now makes. 
that you can sit there and stare up at the stars of a night and see the vastness of the universe, at least you can, if you can get away from light vision. Um, you can glory at the marvels of nature, the intricacies of the human body or any other creature's body, um, the, the, the natural world at a scientific level contains many, many wonders. Carl Sagan argued that there could be a, a sort of scientific style of religion, not involving gods and mysticism, but involving the sheer wonder of the universe, where people could meet up for what you might term, I suppose, services or something, somewhere like that, you could just, and have that sense of wonder, that sense of, of glory, that sense of marvelousness of the universe without losing the, that, that wonder. So you don't have to have the mysticism and wonder. At least that's the argument made by people like Dawkins and Carl Sagan. Whether that pans out to the vast majority of the public is another question. Is this a, an attitude, a rarefied attitude that works well if you're super well educated and very middle class and have a particular set of values and to start with and a particular kind of academic background to start with? that doesn't pan out terribly well for the vast majority of people. That I'm not sure of, that's something to contemplate. But the, it's, it's a counter argument to this notion that rationalization is the, um, the doom of society, robbing it of enchantment, this, this argument that you can have both rationalization science and so forth and enchantment at the same time. Although Dawkins is not making his argument in connection to the, the kind of iron cage of bureaucracy and relentless work, he's making it in respect to the notions argued around um, rationalization and rationalism. So it is two slightly different areas there. What does the future hold? Well, who on earth can say and argue on that one? There's all sorts of different um, approaches we might take and we might contemplate. Undoubtedly there are widespread social problems both around the destruction of nature, around the number of people who are medicated to get through the day. Um, the, the reductionist approach to human nature that comes with a lot of the more ruthless end of business that um, sees things in a very negative light. But equally you've got people like Steven Pinker who are arguing that for every loss there is also a gain that medical science is now at a phenomenal level, able to treat things that would have wiped out thousands of people 100, 200, 300 years ago. And those benefits are only gained through rationalism. And so, yes, you have problems, but then look at the lot of the medieval serf. Were they greatly better off than people drudging in factories today? Or have we just exchanged one type of oppressive situation for another type of oppressive situation? But maybe to, to a point, you've got more people who are able to have jobs that they enjoy now than was the case in, let's say, the 12th century, perhaps, where you had plenty of drudgery and not much enjoyment. You've still got plenty of drudgery, you just have more enjoyment now. So are there gains and losses? Are there shifts and changes? Are there ways we can understand the need for multiple values this idea that um, having one dominant singular value becomes suffocating and oppressive and so that just as uh, Michael Sandel was arguing if we have systems in which multiple values are allowed to flourish will human experience be better and more positive if we can reduce the obsession with bureaucracy and reducing people to the level of units and boxes that have to be ticked, will humanity flourish? Martin Buber, the German theologian, um, argued his distinction between I, you, in which I relate to you as a human being. I recognize that you have all sorts of values of, of things you'll do for fun, for happiness, for love, for intellectual stimulation, as well as for money. I see you as a full rounded human being and hopefully you see me in some way. That positive engagement with other people, he was also saying you can have that with God, but that we're, at the moment we're talking about having that with other human beings or indeed with non-human beings, understanding that other species are also rounded and sort of 
mentally diverse entities with loves and hates and hopes and fears and dreams and so on, the range of motivations. Comparing that to the I-it relationship, where I see you as a thing, an object to be used and then discarded when you are no longer of use, and perhaps you see me as an object to be used and discarded when no longer of use. Um, and it's that I-it relationship between humans and between humans and non-humans, if we see the animal world or, or the plant world or the planet as a whole as an it, a thing, an object to be used and discarded, that arguably leads to the kind of problems we've got now. Can we develop, can society engage in practices that develop and encourage the I-you relationship rather than the I-it relationship? Whether that is directly connected to industrialization, to the growth in bureaucracy, to the growing obsession with money, or that has been around a lot longer, we can debate. I dare say if we went back to ancient Rome, long before the levels of industrialization we have now, we would have found that people's relationship to uh, between slave owner and slave was very much an I it type of relationship. That they weren't all going around seeing everyone as a human being, but uh, as a fully rounded person but seeing large swathes of society as things, as objects to be used and exploited and discarded. So I don't necessarily think that that destructive interpersonal relationship is, is the product of the forces that Max Weber describes, although perhaps an argument could be made that the forces Weber is describing has greatly accelerated and expanded and extended the tendency to view people as it, as things, as objects, rather than as people. And indeed, view the non-human world in that same objectifying light as being its, things, rather than beings. Perhaps. Lots of questions, no answers. That's very typical, isn't it? <laughs> Um, but anyway, that draws to a close as my throat's about to give away. So thank you for listening, and it'd be interesting to get any feedback of ideas, you, whether you agree, disagree, you think some of the theorists are more convincing than other theorists, that sort of thing. Um, we did have a number of other lectures, seminars scheduled for the public this academic year, but obviously with lockdown and so on, they're not going to happen. If this proves a popular format, then um, I will turn at least some of the other planned activities into online events. Um, if it's unpopular, then there doesn't seem any point doing so. But we'll, we'll see what the reaction is and then take it from there as to whether there'll be more events. Certainly next academic year, when hopefully all of this coronavirus situation is over and done with, there will be more um, public seminars then if you keep an eye open. And let me know if you would like to go on the mailing list if you aren't already on the mailing list. But here endeth the sermon, the seminar. So thank you for listening. Let me know your feedback.